So let's talk about the playoffs because you, you got to the playoffs. You played Hereford, who finished 21 points ahead of us. They scored over 100 goals. Chester, of course, were the champions. We, we drew at home over 6,000 at the wreck. And then you couldn't script the replay any better, really. And obviously the way we won it and everything. But what a, what a fantastic period for the, for the football club, that, that, that Hereford um, two-legged playoff. Yeah, what, what what I most remember about it, apart from the silly hat someone gave me, was um, <clears throat> prior to the Hereford game, we couldn't play any worse. The lead up to the Hereford game, <clears throat> we couldn't pass water. We were absolutely awful. And <clears throat> I remember thinking, just get there, just get there, just get just get in the plus, just get in the plus. And without doubt, that Hereford side, which had gone 21 games unbeaten, that was a phenomenal side um, with a phenomenal manager. And they were, they were a lot better than us. So we drew them and it was like a free hit. I don't know what Stu thinks about it, but I thought it was like a free hit. We went into the first game um, with nothing to lose. Yeah. And I remember... I remember doing an interview afterwards and, and, and their, their geezer was full of himself saying how oh, they were the better side and, and, and the, the better footballing side and all that. And they were, which was no issue. And, and I remember just getting up his nose by saying, yeah, they can't handle balls into the box. They can't handle uh, players running in behind. And I can remember thinking, I just made it up out the top of my head, really, just to, to have a pop at the guy. And... We went there really confident and we, yes, did the sending off help? Of course it did. Was it a sending off all day? You know, you weren't going to catch Aaron McLean and uh, whether at the time it would have stuck the ball in the net is another thing, but it's not for the ref to decide, is it? Um, that has to go down as one of my favourite ever uh, Aldershot games. And to beat them at their own place when they were they were better than us, and I thought we were better than um, who do we who do we lose to in the end? Um, Jimmy well, Quinn. Yeah, we're, 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 we're coming to but, that. Yeah, uh, that that yeah. was one Terry, of the best days. Terry, of you couldn't just move your head down a bit. You, your eyes keep going out of. Um, that's it. Better I can see you. There you go. Uh, yeah, Actually, go, go back the other way. <laughs> I can also remember John McGinty getting thrown out of the boardroom uh, for singing, and uh, their manager was also their chairman. And he threw John McGinty out, and we went to a pub on the way home. Boy, that, that was a good night, Stu, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a great night. Yeah, I mean, going back to that game, I mean, he was right what he said. I thought we. I thought we were super that night. They had a they had a number ten, didn't they? I think his name was was it Purdy? Rob Purdy was that his Rob Purdy? Was it? Who was yeah. was one of one of the best best players in the league, and we we did a number on him, didn't we? Yeah, uh, we stopped him from playing, but now we was great that night. It was really good. So we get to to Shrews, uh, to, to Stoke City, Shrewsbury Town. Players say um, Jimmy Quinn in, in charge. What, what are your recollections of, of, to both of you? What are your recollections of, of, of that day? The build up, the atmosphere, everything that went with it. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that one of the differences between, say, Wimbledon and Aldershot was a we were punching above our weight at that time. Had we got promoted, we were nowhere near ready. To, to go um, to go full time for the shows we can. We were nowhere near ready. The team was nowhere near ready. And the club never had a plan. As soon as we went to Wimbledon, they had a plan, like a five year plan, 10 year plan, getting back in play alone. This is how we're going to do it. If we go up, we'll be ready for it. This was like, uh, God knows what would happen if we'd have gone up at Stoke, because I presume we'd have come sh straight back down. Um, there it was the thinking of the board was just do as well as you can yeah just try and get in a plus try and do this try and do that and 
we, as a club, we were nowhere near ready, but that team was every bit as good as Shrewsbury. And I look at, I had to drop Tim Seals, who had played nearly every game because he had an injury. I still don't think he forgives me now for that. But, Dean yeah, and who? Dean Hooper. And, and, and Oops, yeah, we had, I had some problems with Oops because Oops was a fiery character. And uh, we'd had some problems with Oops prior to that. Um, but the Tim Shields one was an injury. And I can always remember sort of telling him and breaking his heart, saying he weren't going to play in the player final. And we went with uh, Roscoe and, and Aaron. And had we had a fit Tim Shields and had a Roscoe or an Aaron to put on, I think we'd have won that game. Yeah. Uh, both of them two tied. We picked up a lot of knocks and injuries by then. And both Aaron was carrying an injury. Roscoe was carrying an injury. I remember Chippy Charles coming on and missing a header when Chippy was good in the air. So we, we, we'd we had a well-balanced squad, but we picked a number of injuries up. Um, I, I've watched the game several times. There weren't much in it. Uh, the difference was... Shrewsbury was a a real big club ready to go up. And um, had we gone up, I don't know. But as a manager, you don't get that license. You just you just take whatever opportunity you get to go up, didn't you? Mm. It was I, very I, early. I you were, going, going back, going back to the day, I, th- I think we we trained at Villa, didn't we? We trained at the. Yeah, you organised all the training, yeah. Yeah, we trained there. We, we started, stopped at Villa and trained there and. That's obviously when we had the chat with Tim Sills and, and Dino. But like I say, it was it was a really tight game, wasn't it? And it, it, it wasn't a lot in between either teams. And then when, as soon as you asked, asked the question, my mind just went back to... I mean, Chippy was a great goal scorer and you'd expect him to score that. But my mind just goes back to that. That was a good chance and... I think there was. I saw a caption the other day of uh, some memories came up on my phone, and uh, I think he, the, the camera goes to Brownie in the dugout as, as Chippy. We both thought he could score it, but yeah. anyway, it wasn't to be, mate. And what, what do you remember about the, the penalty shootout itself? Uh, Who took the I penalty? Remember, I remember the Hereford one. We were very good. Uh, we weren't very good in the the final, were we? No, they didn't score any. Didn't score any. No. no. I remember. I remember. Tim Shields just didn't look. He was so gutted that we left him out. When he come on, he either was carrying that injury, or he'd never come to grips with it. And I think he he, he missed one. I think. Um, I think Aaron McLean was off by then, wasn't he? Yeah, well, the two forwards we taken off, we put Chippy yeah. and Seelsy on. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, if they probably both missed, um, and again, it is a lottery. And and I know I keep harking back to 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 Wimbledon, and I know we're on an order shot thing here, but we learnt the lessons about penalties that were later to benefit us later on. And that is, you need to practice the bloody things. You know, if you look at most playoffs, even after extra time, they go to penalties, sides sort of pull back a bit. They don't want to get beat and it goes to pens. And you know, a lot of a lot of our careers do, has, has been won on pens or lost on pens. Uh, it just so happened, okay, we won the Hereford one on pens. But then we lost the Carlisle. Well, how on earth we lost that on pens is beyond me, but no doubt Graham will go on to that. <laughs> so that's it. So we've missed out, but it's been a great season because you, Pete, who provides the stats here, says that we were the, all the shot of the last part-time team to get to the conference um, playoff final. So that is that just shows it in a way, doesn't it, as to what the achievement was. But there must also be a big part of the reason why in the summer of that year that the, the, the club goes full time. But it's going full time and going full time, isn't there? And it's not an easy process. No. And again, Stu touched on the fact that I was full time and Stu was part time. Mm-hmm. Well, that worked great if Stu's 
plans of sessions, doing a Tuesday night, doing a Thursday night. It became more difficult when we were full-time because, you know, you can't, you've got a young family and you've got, you know, a mortgage and you've got everything else to pay and you've got a really good job. You can't sacrifice that for, even if it's the biggest opportunity you've ever had in football to, to go on. And um, it, it created problems for Stu at both Aldershot and Wimbledon. What I most remember about the Aldershot period was my own ignorance in I'd never worked full time with a squad before. And I'm thinking in that first pre-season, we managed to injure at least eight first-team players. I remember thinking, I've injured him, I've injured him, injured him. It was, I remember having the mentality of, and I remember saying to the players, look, don't give me no uh, bullshit. We should be as fit as Arsenal, and Arsenal were the business then. We should be as fit as Arsenal because they might have fancy machines, but we've got the same time span as they got. We've got good coaches. We've got good physios. We've got um, good sports people that can look at the food. And we, um, Mind you, I was cooking at the time, if I remember oh. right. But, <laughs> but it was... It was my insistence that we should be as fit as, as Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, if if I hadn't bared in mind that they'd gone from being part-time to full-time and in one pre-season you were going to get them fitter than uh, the Arsenal players under Arsene Wenger, we probably don't think that was going to work, Tel. Uh, and I managed to injure, I think, eight of them. Uh, and again, that's experience, but it's experience at the expense of the club you're working at. And... Uh, it you was. Learn you, you learn from that. So, I mean, I've done many, we did yeah. many pre seasons together. And what you always used to say from the first day until the last day of when we used to kick off was yeah. no injuries. No injuries. No, no injuries. And that, that was all that bothered me, Stu, in a pre season game. You wouldn't have played well. But if you played well, scored and beat whoever, if you pitch an injury up, it was a nightmare, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, early into that next season, Stu, you 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 went to St Albans. Um, you had a brief spell as manager at St Albans, but was that the big reason why you went? Because obviously that was a part time situation. You had your your main job, and you couldn't yeah. have combined the two. As Terry as Terry said said earlier on, it it was very diff it was a very difficult period for me because it was one side of me was wanting to have a go at full time and I did it for a little bit as in doing a few mornings a week and then going to work after it never really worked Graham and going back you know when we talk a bit later about the all about the Wimbledon scenario it was identical to what happened at, at, at Wimbledon to Walshaw and it was very very difficult um, trying to combine two um, two roles as in you know your assistant role doing your football and the thing what paid the mortgage and looked after the kids and and kept the you know your wife happy and you know making a live a decent lifestyle it was very difficult and it and I, I thought and it it come to the stage where not only in working during the day you know you're working doing the football a couple of mornings a week and then you're going to work then you're going watching games watching players I was never in and yeah my kids I say to my kids now when up to there was. I used to, I, I missed a load of their growing up because yeah. I was all that working and it became yeah. untenable. So that's the reason I, you know, I, I spoke to Brownie about it and obviously we had Martin with us at the time. And then I took the, the, the uh, Sir Albans job. And then within the first week, come to first payday, uh, I had a meeting with the chairman. Yeah, this is what your budget is. First week, went to pay the players and there was no wages for half of them. So, uh, but that's an, obviously another story. So whatever I was going to get, I mean, do I really need this? Let me, and I just came out of football, just went to, went back to work and just concentrated on doing my work. Uh, and it's, it, it's a funny thing, Stu, because we had that experience before at, at, at Aldershot. And then we had the experience, I can remember Simon Bass saying to me, who's an ex-Aldershot man, of course. I remember Simon Bass saying to me, he, he was a cabbie, so he, he, he you know, he had another job so he could 
do the training in the morning, go cabin. When you're non-league, I used to work up until the order shot job. I used to work as a sales sales rep. I'd go out, do a do a I don't know six hours work, then plan for training and do the training, and I'd be happy to sample and have a beer afterwards. That's all right. But when you're doing it the other way around, and Bass said he couldn't. He couldn't get the willpower going to work after he'd get up in the morning, plan the training session, do the training session, have your lunch. He couldn't bring himself to going back out to work because it's it's different, isn't right. it? You're not yeah. you're, the other way, you're doing something you love later on extra, whereas nobody loves work, do they really? Yeah. And as as you would know, Graham, being the secretary of all the shots at, at the time not only doesn't just evolve around the training, it's dealing with the players. I mean, the players might have a problem at home, a problem with the car, a problem with the wages. And, you know, obviously the gaffer Terry used to deal with most of those things and they used to come to him and then he, they used to obviously go through me. There's so, so many of the things to evolve by being a full-time manager than just training and playing. It's dealing with a group of 22, 23, 20 players and they've all got different issues, and that takes time. Yeah, absolutely. So, Stuart's gone then, Terry, and we're going to come back to you shortly, Stuart, because we've still got plenty to talk about. But you, you carry on, Terry, for the 0405 season. As you said earlier, Martin Call is, is with you. Um, you signed, played, signed Darren Barnard, which was a, a key signing, went on to play um, well, over 100 games for, for the club and with a local lad as well, and that fitted really well after a really good career. Um, and for the second season running, you, you, you get to the playoffs, and Carlisle will come up again, of course. Um, you've been 1 0 at home, and then Bedlam at, at Brunton Park in front of over 10,000 fans. Yeah, I think in hindsight, we should, we should have come off when Bully got pushed over. Um, I, <laughs> I remember Bully, I remember the penalties on that. I can also remember uh, Jamie Slabber scoring the equaliser. But we were good value. We were battering them. We were good value for that. And I thought we were a better side than them, but then we weren't a better side than Erifford and won the year before. So we lost on penalties. I can remember being 3 1 up. I remember Bully saving the first three. And he said to me before, I'm going to dive the same way every time. So. He died the same way, and then they get, and I'm thinking, bully, change it now for heaven's sake, because they, they ain't going to keep putting it the same. So it wasn't bully's fault. I might add, bully was brilliant, and if you save three penalties, you're entitled to be on the winning side. And um, my Yeovil connection uh, seriously let us down at Carlisle. They were good boys. Uh, Critz missed one. Uh, the centre half missed one. Another boy that had played for Yeovil, he missed one. And so I blame the Oval Town for that, basically. <laughs> and and whoever it was, Giles, he hit the bar, didn't he? Well, yeah. if he had VAR then, he hit the bar and it come down behind the line and come out. But, you know, it was the Carlisle end. They, they're they not too good at maths up north. And they they invaded the pitch when they hadn't even won the bloody game, uh, hadn't won the penalties, they invaded it. So you ain't won yet. And they pushed Bully over. Loads of things I remember, but I was very proud of that team because um, the the I remember Will Antry hadn't played too well prior to that, and then we were going to get rid of him, and then he come back in, done well. Brett Johnson done well. We were solid that day, and um, and again the, the margins are so small. Whether whether you've won that, whether you've lost that, basically. We didn't get the penalties right, Stu. And that's mm. it. Mm. No. And, and you talk about Nicky Ball there. For, for both of you, you know, he went through with Nicky for a, a number of years. Talk about, about Nicky. And, you know, he was a young goalkeeper at the time. I think he won the won the Isthmian Premier when he was 19 or 20 with you. And a lot of managers go for experience. George did. He went with, with Gary Phillips. He went with Andy Pape as his goalkeepers. And then when he came in, he went for a a totally different kind of keeper in terms of his background. Yeah, I, 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 to be fair, I can't take much credit for Nicky because uh, Willie Wordsworth, my assistant at uh, 
Hayes, uh, when I when I took the order shop job, he brought Nicky in from QPR on loan. And uh, I was looking for a keeper and, and Willie said to me, you need to go and get this boy. He's, he's, he's really, really good. And he's got a great uh, attitude. And Nicky had a great attitude, great attitude to, to winning, would win at all costs. And uh, very headstrong, very, very uh, short fuse. Uh, you know, you have him and Dean Hooper in the same dressing room and it's like, yeah, hard work. Uh, but that passion drives driv, drove them and helped drive the team. Nicky was uh, uh, a, a really good signing, one of my best ever goalkeeper signings, without a doubt, and went on to get promotion with Aldershot, do Aldershot proud, and, and is now doing a good job at Leverhead managing. And uh, who knows, might one day uh, get a sniff around the Aldershot job. I know it's something he'd like. And Stu, what, 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 you know, were you surprised, Stuart, that, that, that Nicky became a manager or did you see see that in him? No, no, not at all, no. Not at all, no. As, as Brian just said, he's, he was opinionated without overstepping the mark. He was headstrong. He knew, he knew how to football as well, what, outside the game, he, what he wanted, what he wanted to do in life. And he's, he had a, his vision. I, I, I speak to him on a regular basis now. Uh, and he's, he's he's close to my eldest boy. He, he sort of does a lot of things with him uh, together. Um, and he was, I can remember having an argument with him. I don't know if you remember this, Brown. No, I think you'd gone out of the dressing room at the time. I think you, um, I can't remember what game it was, but you'd, you'd put your point across to the team. And Nicky was very good in the dressing room. He was a, he was a good organiser. He was good at getting the boys together. And uh, Brownie had come in and, and, uh, said a few things to the team and then you'd left the dressing room and then I said something you know the way we used to work if yeah, yeah. good cop I was a bad cop vice versa you know that's the way we used to work together and then I said a few things and Nicky piped up with something then there was a in the Holton days then we used to have tea in the dressing room with a big tea urn <laughs> and um, and and I was standing here next door to the, the table and Nicky sat in the corner. And he didn't mean to, to, to kick the tea over me, but um, he kicked the table out of frustration. And um, probably because he didn't agree with what I was saying or he didn't agree with what one of the books. Anyway, this tea went right all over me. So obviously I've reacted to that and I've gone flying at him. And um, we had a few words and the tea... Anyway, the air got cleared and... We speak every so often now, and he's he's a great lad, and and we, we you know we we uh, he's a good pal of me and Brian is, and he's a, he's a really good lad. I've, I've got I've got another Nicky Ball story, sure. and it was, wasn't the Hereford semi final. It was a league game at Hereford, and Nicky just prior to half time, Nicky had let in a free kick, which you know, the kids has bent it over the top of the wall. And I'm like, Nick is in the wrong place. Nick is in the wrong place. And Pridge wouldn't have it. He's part of the goalkeeping union. Oh, them two so, are close now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he wouldn't have it. No, no, well, you stand in the right place, blah, blah, blah. Well, if he's standing in the right place, he, he, he should have dived quick or he should have moved his ass a bit quicker, blah, blah, blah. So I'm mad. And uh, I say, you're in the wrong place. And he goes, absolute. He said, absolute bollocks, rubbish. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not, you were never a goalie or something like that. Uh, and uh, Stuart Jelly, I never had a lot of patience for, uh, I never used to think, I never used to think a changing room was a debate in society. It was, I'd say something, and if you didn't like it, come off. And I took him off at half time. I went, off you come in. Yeah. And we had a spare goalie. I can't remember who it was. Richard Barnard. Bugger me. He's he's got himself sent off. The new goal he's got himself sent off within thirty seconds of coming on. <laughs> coming on. So there I am with Nicky and Paul Bridge in the background. I've just changed the goalie. He gets sent off after thirty seconds of the second half. I'm thinking probably not the best half-time team talk you've ever done, Brandy. But no doubt Nicky would have learned from that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. And we, 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 we can't go any further without talking about Paul Pretty because Paul was a massive part of the football club for 15, 16 years, served through so many different managers. And for both of you, you would have been very close to him. Very much so, yeah. He was... Uh... He was um, he was very very much a big part of the goalkeepers' union in many ways. He to fight his corner for the goalkeepers. He was really protective of them. Uh, but you speak to I mean we we took Nicky to Margate with us in our in sort of our, our last job together, and um, you know they all speak really highly of Pridzi. Great, fantastic character. Really good guy. Still friends of ours today. We. We see him and speak to him on a regular basis. And Still can't drink. No, he can't drink now, and he's never, he's uh, he's never been able to drink at all now. But he's, <laughs> he's a good, funny guy. We call him the space. We call him the space invader. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a good guy. He must be. He must be struggling with his social distancing. Yeah. Was that the right time for me to leave? Obviously, I had the issues with my my lovely wife, Susie, and I, I had to pack up. I, I would have had that tinge of jealousy in there, but I still genuinely loved the club and how they treated me through the whole five years I was there. 